Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics where we grow cool plants and today we're here invited by Stephen List who's the teacher as well as um, educational instructor for the Silmar Agricultural Learning Center um, here at the Charter School and we've got as guest um, Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery. We've also got um, Ellie Cook Company that's going to be here, the California Rare Fruit Growers and so many other educational people that are going to tell you all about fruit growing care and tips both in ground as well as in pots so check out this video so we also have a booth here at the event um, I'm gonna recap some of the things that our product has to offer as well as um, the pint size the can size as well as the spray bottle ready to use and let me just recap just briefly what our products are about check this out Morning. Morning. <laughs> So let me give you a quick intro of um, the things here at our booth. Firstly, a lot of you asked me where can you find the products in. I've got here a few of our retailers, starting with the Home Depot, Amazon Prime, Sears, Arbico Organic, um, Harmony Farms and Supplies, Walmart, as well as Rakatoon. Um, and that's just to name a few. There's a lot more. Um, and you can do your research with that. Our products come in three colors, um, white, as well as green and brown and I like to point out the fact that with our white products it's now registered material for use in organic agriculture and colors brown and green are currently pending um, and this is pretty much what comes in the containers it comes with the white um, the organic paint powder and then it also comes with these oils that are in your oil vial and the oils that are contained in it as you can see over here is um, organic castor cinnamon oil clove oil cedarwood oil garlic oil peppermint oil and rosemary oil and Here's your product label again, Ivy Organics. It's a three-in-one plant card. Protection against damaging it's sunburn, insects, rodents for use on your fruit trees, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. And it's a non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic product. And um, also available in the one gallon size as well. And let me share a few of the plants with you. Another thing a lot of you, oh, and the other thing too is we also now have it available as a spray bottle as well, where it's ready to go spray. And you can take a look here at the label. It says three-in-one plant guard and you'll start finding this um, with your retailers as well. Um, something else a lot of you ask is the colors. What does it look like on the plant? And that's why I've got these examples here for you as well. These we've opened and mixed with water and used them to now paint the trees. This here is an orange tree that we coated with the brown ivy organics. And then above that we'd use the green ivy organics. And then over here we've got an apple tree that we coated with the white ivory organic. So at least you have a comparison contrast with those three. And then here we took the organic three-in-one plant guard spray and we've got in here our peppers and our strawberries and our tomatoes and our flowers. And you can see that we um, sprayed these yesterday and you can see the um, organic sunblock film that's on here. It also has the protection of the seven natural oils as well. And all of that, you can see again, if you zoom in, you can see the tomato leaves covered with the ivory organics. And this will offer protection from sun stress as well as repel insects off of your plants. Um, and you'd simply shake it. I'll do another coat just for demonstration purposes and you can just spray that on your leaves like so. We don't want to put too much. Um, one coat is, is all the plant needs. Now take a look at these banners, follow me. So over here, ivory organics, first protection, sunblock benefits the benefits include sunburn protection sun scald protection premature blooms what it's going to do is it's going to keep the bark of your plants cool so that they don't prematurely go into bloom being tricked that it's um, springtime anti-transparent is basically by spraying it on the plants it's going to help keep your plant cool and retain more moisture um, prune trees and plants um, any of those prune surfaces should be coated with the product as well and the last thing, you can use it on all your new and established trees, shrubs, and vegetables. Our second banner over here is insect repellent. You can see over here we got roaches and mosquitoes and termites and um, those are just some examples, grasshoppers. And the goal is, again, for your prune trees, damaged bark, coat your bulbs, time release, new and established um, trees, shrubs, and vegetables. And our third banner over here is rodent repellent, and these are just a few examples, the squirrels, the rabbits, and the mice. Again, prevent girdled trees, protect your bulbs from these rodents, time release as well, and as on all the banners, use this on your new and established trees, shrubs, and vegetables.
Okay, so keep that in mind. After the raffle, we're gonna have, I mean, after uh, we have our talk, we're gonna have the raffle and our potluck lunch and more tours of the garden. So whatever you want, please, please, this is all our house, okay? So get a drink and let's go in and get this thing going. Really? You got a heavy one, dude. Houston, we have a problem. I have the wrong car. Experts are on hand to answer questions after the talk. But I want to introduce my friend Steve List. He's here to learn and our annual, right? <laughs> this is the so fifth far. year. So he thinks it's fourth, but if last year was the fourth, what's this year? So far, I hope. Now, you know, I'm getting a little older and I lose a year or two in between. But anyhow, um, and every year Tom Spellman always comes out, always gives us a, a really good presentation. Even if you've heard his pitch before, yeah. He'll add new stuff. He'll, he's always up to date on everything that he does. That being said, we're going to introduce him later. I'd like to also <laughs> introduce him. I'm good at rambling. The way I talk, I don't prepare. I just, hopefully, it comes out okay. Um, Your poor students. Yeah, oh my god. I don't have any, they, they're all out there working. Uh, I'd like to introduce... Uh, Charles, Park. yeah, they got a great new product. Brad has been a friend of mine for many, many years. He worked at Treeland, Normans. Now he's helping out in this new company. So please feel free to get information from them. We do give away, we do donate. In Rich LA, right there, everybody knows Tommaso Grady. Okay, we give a ton of stuff to them and they build gardens and schools. Our primary thing is we grow to give to schools, community gardens, and low-income families. But be careful about taking stuff that's back. Everything out here is going to be for the raffle. Again, that money for the raffle is going to go directly back to students for scholarships. I want to give a few gifts away, just for speaker gifts, because if I don't do it now, I'll forget. But for Tom, Charles, Charles loves our coffee. Huh? Do you drink coffee? By the way, Tom, do you drink coffee? <laughs> I got some high-end intelligentsia. And Brad? You guys are going to have to fight over a box, okay? So cool. Thank you. Brad also knows that he's been, he's been helping getting trees for some of the community oh, gardens in his area, too. So we're here to help. We donate everything. Um, anything you need, as long as uh, I can handle it, I don't usually say no. Do I, Tony? No. All right, right. That being said, let's give Tom a big welcome. Here we go. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Tom. Thanks for having me back again. You know, I'm uh, I very seldom in the past have turned down speaking engagements, but I'm uh, I'm planning on doing less and less of this in the future to dedicate more time to my family. I'm missing a lot of Saturday events. I'm going to miss my granddaughter's soccer game today, so uh, you won't see quite as much of me in the future as you have in the past. But I'll still try and do what I can for Steve. I think this is a really cool event. And I'm planning on doing half a dozen, maybe Saturdays per year, so uh, you'll see me around somewhere. And, and you know, still weekdays or weeknights, I'll probably do some of those too. I'm a Southwestern sales manager for Dave Wilson Nursery. For those of you that don't know Dave Wilson Nursery, we are um, the largest grower of fruit and nut trees in the United States. We grow on about uh, just over 3,000 acres of property in the San Joaquin Valley. And this year we produce just over 13 million trees. So a lot of almonds, a lot of walnuts, because the, the, the nut industry has just gone crazy. They've gone nuts for nuts. So um, you know, we're doing a lot of those, and we do a lot of stone fruits, palm fruits, figs, pomegranates, blueberries, caneberries, grapes, all of those things that are for both for the farm industry, the agricultural industry, for farmers market growers, and for wholesale and retail nurseries. So my product you know, that goes through retail nurseries in turn is available for you guys to purchase for um, you know backyard plantings, and that's really what I focus on. 
Uh, we have a lot of really intelligent people on staff, people that are much smarter than I am, that work with uh, the commercial growers, the agriculturalists around the world. And uh, my thing is backyard growing. I've been doing this now. I've been in the nursery industry for 45 years. Mm -hmm. I know I look young, but I'm really not <laughs> as young as I look. So 45 years doing this, and I still love it. I still love to get out and see people. I still love to go talk about trees. I still love to do events like this where I can reach out to the public and, and you know reach people like you and hopefully lend a little bit of valuable information. So my, my lecture today, I know a lot of you guys have probably already heard it, but like Steve said, I always add something new. So my lecture today is Backyard Orchard Culture, which is a, a concept, a philosophy on what to do as a backyard grower as opposed to what a commercial grower would do. So there are a lot of similarities in what we would do in a backyard and what a commercial grower would do, but there are a lot of variables too, where a commercial grower would never ever think of planting three or four varieties in the space of one tree. You know, a commercial grower is gonna give each tree 150, 200, 250 square feet. They're gonna grow um, acres and acres of the same type of fruit. They're gonna grow a lot of fruit that they can harvest at one time. Where, as opposed to what you guys want to do, you guys don't want a lot of fruit at any one given time. You want a little bit of fruit all the time, right? right? So you would never consider doing what a farmer does. You would never consider trying to grow trees like a farmer, trying to, to culture trees like a farmer, or even expect the crop that a farmer would get. You know, if I was a commercial grower of peaches up in the San Joaquin Valley, I would be looking to harvest between 300 and 400 pounds of peaches off of my commercial trees. So most peach varieties ripen up in about a two week period of time. So if, if you harvested 800 peaches off of a tree in your backyard and they're only gonna be ripe for two weeks, what are you gonna do with them? I mean, unless you have a roadside stand or a whole lot of friends and neighbors, you're not gonna be able to make proper use of that fruit. So the, the, the important concept is grow managed crops. Grow a crop that's easy for you to be able to use. So if I get 50 pounds of peaches on any one variety, it's still more than I can really feasibly use. Uh, for all practical purposes, on a variety that's gonna ripen up in two weeks, I'm looking at 20, 30, 40 pounds of fruit, and I'm perfectly happy with that. I still have plenty to give away. Uh, I still have uh, <coughs> plenty of fruit for my daughter to come and steal some, and, and you know, it, it give some to the neighbors. So a manageable amount of fruit for ripening in a short period of time is really important. Now, the variances would be citrus, avocados, things like that that will hang on the tree for months, not weeks. So I, I would never consider um, only 40 pounds of avocados on my house avocado tree. I mean, that would be ridiculous because then I could never never supply all the demand for avocados in my neighborhood and, and you know, being the, the kind person that I am. So I'm always looking at being able to grow some varieties that are gonna hang on a tree uh, and be able to harvest those for a longer period of time. Well, I still like the, the successive ripening philosophy there. So if I did this, if I took um, uh, a Pinkerton avocado that's ripe right now, and I took a Hass that's ripe in through early to midsummer, and a reed that ripens late summer and into fall, and a Stewart or a Bacon that ripens up in the fall and into winter, now I've got four varieties of successive ripening avocados, and I can go out any day of the week and probably pick two varieties. So that's where successive ripening becomes important. And for me, on stone fruit trees, I like a manageable size about right here. I like to be able to put up my hand and do all the work that I need to do on that tree. I don't want a 15 foot Santa Rosa plum. I want to be able to manage it from the ground. Last night, I spent about an hour and a half out in my, in my yard. I thinned my mid pride peach, I thinned my Eva's pride peach, I thinned my spicy nectar plum, and I did everything from the ground. I never had to climb a ladder, climb a tree, uh, use a pole pruner, I did everything from, from the ground because those trees are right here. So there's three basic, what I would consider, concepts to backyard orchard culture. So the first one is control tree size so it's manageable for you. And I'm not the one that's gonna tell you how big your tree should be because I'm not gonna manage your tree. You know what my size is, it's right here. Now for avocados and citrus, 12 feet, 14 feet, that's fine. I can manage that with a 10 foot pole and a basket picker. But on stone fruit trees, I want small, easy to manage trees. So my size is right here, you choose your size. I'll never never tell you how big your tree should be, I'll just tell you grow a tree that's manageable for you. And once you choose that size, 
keep the tree pruned to that size indefinitely. So you're always going to go back to that chosen size. Your pruning body is always going to be below that point. So size management, number one most important concept of backyard orchard culture. Number two, we already talked about, successive ripening. So instead of growing one tree of, of a, one big tree of a variety, I'm going to go through three or four smaller trees so that I have size managed crops. Say, we can, we talk about avocados, and I can say peaches. I can grow a May Pride, an Eva's Pride, a Mid Pride, and an August Pride, and I can throw a Carnival or a Sundown or one of those later varieties into it, and now I've got four months worth of successive ripening peaches, maybe in the space of, of what two commercial trees would have taken up. So instead of getting just a couple of weeks worth of fruit, now I have three or four months worth of fruit out of the same amount of space. So size management, successive ripening, and then the third, I think the third most important concept is grow what you like and what you'll use. It doesn't do you any good to grow things that you really don't have a use for. And I had a great phone call about 10 years ago. This, that's probably middle of October, and this guy calls me, and he, he doesn't even introduce himself. He just says, what do you do with quince? Oh, well, you know, when I was a kid, I used to throw cats on my grandmother's back fence. And uh, he said, ah, yeah, he says, my, my wife's a cat lover. I don't think I can do that. And, and uh, you know, here's my story. About five years ago, I went down to the Kmart. It was the end of the bare root season, and they had all these little trees in bags with sawdust, and they were all on sale for $5. I said, hey, that's great. You can't grow a tree for $5. And he said, yeah, but all they had left were quince, so I bought five of them. <laughs> so, Minimal financial investment of $25, not a big deal. But now consider this, five years worth of your garden space, five years worth of irrigation, five years worth of fertilization, five years worth of pruning to grow a beautiful crop of quince and have no idea what to do with it. But he says, I went out to the tree and I picked a fruit and I took a bite out and it was horrible. He said, well, yeah, but you know, quince in general is a processing fruit. They, they make jams and jellies and my grandmother used to make quince tarts and and you know, that's what it's for. It's not the kind of fruit that you pick off a tree and take a bite out of. It's not an apple or a peach. He says, well, that's really what I was looking for. So, you know, he made a huge mistake and lost five years worth of time in the meantime. So, grow what you like and what you'll use. Also consider what's adaptable in my area. Now, you guys, the California rare fruit growers are the, the greatest group that I've ever seen as far as experimentation. You guys are willing to stick your neck out. You guys are willing to do something even though somebody says you can't do it. And that's what I really love about this group. You guys, you have no fear. You know, if you fail, you just pull it out and put something else in or graft it over to another variety. So you guys are always willing to try new things. And you guys have been a wonderful group to, to release experimental varieties to. Um, when we do something new and exciting, you guys are always the ones that, that are out there looking for it. And I always get feedback as to how things are doing. I, I truly appreciate that. I appreciate everything that you guys do along those lines. But you know what? What you guys do is—is is you are you're basically fearless. You don't. If somebody says to that, you know, uh, never. I don't want to hear anybody say I don't have any more room. I can't plant any more trees because there's always room. <laughs> so you know, enjoy it. Do do keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're good at. Keep experimenting. And keep giving me your feedback because I I totally appreciate that and I love it. So those three concepts. Take those three concepts into consideration. If I were to walk out the door and go home right now, if you just follow those three concepts, you'll be a much, much better backyard grower. And I would venture to say that 90% of you in this room are already doing all of those things. So that, that's wonderful. The other thing that I think is important that I've never heard a retail nursery professional ask this question of a customer. Do you understand your microphone? Now, I don't mean what zone you're in. I don't care what your sunset zone or USDA zone is. I, you know, I, I, I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned with what happens on your piece of real estate, what goes on your piece of property. I want to know everything about my piece of property. I want to be able to understand all of it. So where do I have sun? Where do I have shade? What time of year do I have sun? What time of year do I have shade? Varies quite a bit. Summertime, sun's right there. Wintertime, sun's over here. So where I may have shade in the winter, I probably have sun in the summer. Understand your exposure. Understand your soil type. And everybody says, oh yeah, I got pretty good soil. I would, um, I would say that when the contractor built your house, your property did not look like it looks today. So probably there were some hills and there might have been a stream bed, there might have been some valleys, there might have been a, a whole different topography 
to the land that you live on. And the, and the contractor came in and said, take that bulldozer and push that hill in that valley over there. So now I've got this portion of my property that's filled where I have really good drainage. I've got this portion over here where they took the hill off that's cut, so it's hard soil. It's not, it doesn't drain well. So you need to know that. If you don't understand the drainage all over your property, you need to check that out. So dig some holes, make them all the same size. Uh, 18 inches, 18 inches deep, 12 inches wide, whatever you wanna do. Don't dig one or two, dig 10 or 15 or 20. Go back and fill them all with water, and then go back and take a look at all those holes and how long did it take those to drain? That's gonna be a great indicator of your soil type. Well, see these three over here, they drain in about 10 minutes. And the ones over here on this side, they, they took about three hours to drain. Over here, there was still water in them the next morning. So that's, that's easy, I've got great drainage, fair drainage and poor drainage. I need to know that. I need to know that when I'm making a decision as to what to plant in that location. So if I wanna put in something that absolutely has to have fast drainage, and drainage is critical, you know, for, for most varieties, drainage is critical. So I wanna know what my drainage is like, and, and, and I, can, I can change that, I can correct that. If I've got poor drainage over here and I wanna plant some avocado trees, maybe it's my frost-free area, so all I need to do is plant them on a rise. Get them up above your native grade. Plant them on a 12 inch or an 18 inch rise. And now I've got an area where the soil can oxygenate around the top. I've got an area where the roots can successfully grow. And even though they're gonna grow down into that hard pen eventually, I still have an area where that water can get away. It's not gonna stagnate. It's not gonna be, become anaerobic from, from staying too wet. So as long as you know what your drainage is, you absolutely <coughs> have options to correct it. But most things in general are gonna appreciate good fast draining soil. Irrigate thoroughly and let them go slightly dry in between, not bone dry, slightly dry, and then irrigate thoroughly again. So understand all those things about your property. Where's my where's my wind shelter? You know, where's my shelter from the Santa Ana winds in, in October, November, December? Where are my frost-free areas? Where are my cold areas? Maybe I want to plant something that requires more chill than I would normally get in my area. Well, I can put it up against this garage wall where the where it gets shade in, in the wintertime. And uh, there's, there's a fence that runs alongside it, so that's an area where the frost is gonna settle. That cold air is gonna stop there and settle there. It's not gonna drain out. So now I have an area where I'm gonna get more chill than I would over on the hillside where I planted my avocados. Because, you know, no matter what you, you think you get for chill hours, it still doesn't take your microclimate into consideration. So I may only get 50 chill hours over here, but I may get 250 over here. So just because you know, you looked at the Seamus weather station and it said they had 150 chill hours in your area. It doesn't mean that that's what you have on your property. It's always going to be different. You're always going to have opportunity to look for areas that are more frost free and look for areas that are colder. You need to understand that. That's what's going to make you successful. You know, planting the right variety in the wrong place is not going to help you out at all. So, and, and I, I know I've, I've heard this a, a million times. I went down to the nursery and I bought a uh, Eureka lemon tree, and I, I took it home and uh, and planted it, and, and six weeks later the tree's dead. That nurseryman sold me a bad tree. Well, you know what? That nurseryman has 50 more of those, and they're all still alive. But he sold you the one bad one? Come on. So chances are you didn't take that microclimate into consideration when you put that tree out. So you want to understand everything you can about your property. Once you understand that, you have the ammunition to go in and put the right variety in the right area. What if I wanted to plant a uh, pomegranate? Where would I put that? Sunny. Sunny? Dry. Dry? Absolutely. So if I were to take a pomegranate and put it in an area where the water runs off the lawn and it stays moist all the time and it gets shade three-fourths of the day, would I expect a good crop of pomegranates? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. So once you understand your microclimate, once you understand everything about what your property lends itself to, then you can make the right decision and put the right variety in the right area, and that equals success. So pay close attention to that. If you don't understand it, take some time to get to know it. You know, go out and dig those test holes. Run that irrigation system and put uh, put some you know cups. Take take thirty of these cups here. Put them all out in the yard and run the irrigation system, and then go back and look what's in the cup. Well. These over here, there was a quarter of an inch in, and these over here, there was a half an inch in, and this over here, there was a, whole, a full inch in these over here. So now I know what my irrigation system does when I'm running. I, I know that I get a little bit of irrigation over here, and I get quite a bit over there. So you, you want to understand that. If you don't understand it, take some time to get to know it. 
Any questions on those four concepts before we move on? Yes. How about planting in pots? We'll, we'll talk a little bit about okay. planting in pots as, as we go on. Thank you. So um, what I would what I want to do now is, yeah, we're not putting lots of trees. I have a lot of space. I bought a, a property that has a lot of land, so I've got a, because I'm a crazy fruit tree fanatic, just like you guys are. <laughs> and I need that space. I want outdoor space. But if I go and look at the new the new um, landscapes and the new uh, homes, they just uh, built a development just uh, south of me where they put in 45 new homes on 18 acres. And they bu also built a park, and they've got streets and sidewalks and everything in there. Well, the average size of a backyard is probably uh, you know about the size of this area up in front where I'm standing. So those people aren't going to plant 25 fruit trees in their backyard, but they can put a few things in containers. Maybe they can espalier or something or or do something to, to enjoy it. But you know, if space is limited and you're and you're growing things in containers, maybe you're renting. Maybe you you don't want to uh, plant trees in a yard when you're only going to be there for a year or two years, but you still want to enjoy some fruit. So container culture is extremely important. Um, my, my first word of wisdom on that is use a container that is as large as you can handle. So for me, I like the half uh, wine barrels or whiskey barrels. They're kind of rustic looking. My landscape is fairly rustic. I've got an old log cabin in my backyard and I've got you know all kinds of old farm implements and you know garden art and things like that. It's a rustic landscape. So the half <coughs> whiskey barrels work really well into my landscape. It's the largest size container that I can actually still move around myself. So um, make, make sure you can handle it. If you need to move it, you want to be able to move it. If I have a, a mango growing out in a, in a half barrel and it's going to freeze tonight, I want to move it up underneath the patio or, or whatever, for whatever, whatever reason I would need to move it. So you want to be able to grow in a size where you can manage moving that container. So I like the half barrels. You know, they're rustic. They're, they're, it's the largest size I can move. And you can grow a pretty good sized tree in a half barrel. But the, the trick to anything where you want longevity, you know, if I look at if I look at this tree right here, here's a here's an eight-foot tree in a five-gallon container. And when I look at this tree and I look at that root system, this is a nursery tree. This is not a tree that's meant to have longevity in this container. This should be in this container for one season. And one season only. After that, I should either shift it up into a larger container or I should get it planted in the ground. So for me to consider growing this tree in this container for the next 10 years, that's not gonna work. But if I were to take this tree and I were to sculpt it out, round it off a little bit and grow it in a half barrel, I wanna make sure that the, the fruiting body of that tree, the, the, the head structure of that tree is something that is in balance with the root zone that I've given it to grow in. So my half barrel is about 30, 33 gallons in capacity. I'm gonna grow the head of that tree to match in size approximately the size of that row. Go ahead. So that's where you're going to get longevity. That's where you're going to be able to grow a tree in a container for five years or ten years. And the, one of the things I like about the half barrels, they're not permanent. They last about five, six, seven years, and then the barrel actually blocks away. So every five or six or seven years, I have the opportunity to knock the barrel rings down and throw the old stays in the fire pit, get a new barrel and set it down, drill some holes in the bottom, put about six or eight inches of soil in the bottom, take my old established root ball, take slice six inches off the bottom, take a couple slices off the side, put it back in the new container, pack some new soil around it, prune the head size back again to match the, the amount of pruning I did on the root system, I'm good for another five, six, seven years. I have a Nagami kumquat that I've had for 38 years, and it's in a half barrel. It's gone through seven half barrels. 38 years, but I keep the plant the size of the barrel. I never let it get any bigger. It's got a beautiful crop of kumquats on it. I pick a handful of kumquats every day, and, and the plant is, you know, just spectacular. A little bonsai nagami kumquat in a half wine barrel, and, and every time the barrel rots out, I do just exactly that, transplant it into a new barrel. So if you want longevity, balance between top and root will give you that longevity. When you, when you switch out the barrels, do you do root trimming? Absolutely. Yeah, so I said, take about six inch slice off the bottom, take a couple slices off the side, so I'm reducing that root ball and taking off the wrapping roots on the bottom, and I'm, I'm giving it a new soil you know, column to grow into by reducing that. Since I'm putting it back into the same size container I took it out of, I want to reduce the root structure to give it room to expand out one more time. I didn't hear you mention that. Yeah. 
Uh, you were tardy. I want you to stay after class for now. I want you to write on the board, Alex was a bad boy. <laughs> on the topic of pots and containers, um, uh, and I'm assuming based on what's on your property, the whiskey barrels is your preference, but um, people, I don't know how many people know about the air pots, like where the plant grows and and gets tapered off naturally as it grows through these pots. But yeah. what's your experience on what's the best <coughs> product for home gardeners to use between those plastic black containers versus clay versus the whiskey barrels versus? You know what? I've, I've used them all. I've, I've grown in everything that you would ever consider to be a container and some things that should have never been containers. And they, they all work. I mean. But what I don't like about black pots is if you're growing out in a really hot, sunny area, yeah. black pots heat up on that sunny side, and you can absolutely have root desiccation on the, on the sunny side of a hot container like that. So I like lighter colors or neutral colors, and I, you know, drainage is key. So as long as you have good drainage, whether it's wood or whether it's plastic or whether it's ceramic, as long as you have good drainage, you'll be fine. But try and keep those, those pots where they're not gonna really heat up too much in, in the summer sun. Well, they normally don't have any holes at all. Yeah. Because when they store them at the nursery, they keep watering. Otherwise, they shrink and they fall apart. So you, you're, you're drilling holes in the bottom. And I usually put six or eight or ten inch and a half or two inch holes in the bottom. And then I put an old piece of window screen over that so that I, I lose water, but I don't lose soil. Yeah, one of my, you know, one, I, I, I always feel this way. Most everything is going to grow better in the ground than it will in a container. But there's there's an exception to that rule. Every rule there's an exception to. The exception there, I think, is blueberries. How many people have grown blueberries? Good, a lot of people. Are. Wow. Well, I absolutely, I have lots of different blueberries. They're all in half wine barrels. Some barrels have two or three or four varieties in the barrel, and I just grow them as one, you know, structure. And uh, Nothing makes me happier than to go out onto my patio in May when my granddaughters are out there just mowing down on the blueberries on those half barrels. They're all right there where they can reach them, and I just think, have that enjoy the blueberries. So there, there's, for container culture, blueberries work really, really well. There are two things that are important to blueberry culture in Southern California, and we have all kinds of varieties that do well there. Anything that's considered a Southern high bush blueberry or a Southern hybrid type blueberry will all do well in Southern California with virtually no chill at all. The, the two critical elements for, for proper blueberry culture are you need an acidic soil mix and you need fast, fast, fast drainage. So they don't like to stay wet, they don't like to stagnate, they like to be thoroughly irrigated and go slightly dry in between, not bone dry, slightly dry. So again, keep it into consideration the ratio, the top to, to root zone ratio. So all my blueberries in half wine barrels are just this nice little ball that's about the size of the half wine barrel. So I keep them in balance. So when blueberry season's over, late July, 1st of August, at that point, I take them back heavily, take them back down to a, just a very small structure. That growth in August, September, October, into November, that's all you're fruiting with for the next season. So blueberries, you would never ever consider winter pruning a blueberry only want to summer prune blueberries. Every cut you make in the winter will be taking fruit away from that plant because they produce on all those tips that harden up in the fall when the plant goes dormant. And they usually don't even go dormant. They usually just get a little fall color and then the foliage will drop off in the spring as the new, as the new growth and the flowers come. So for blueberries, if you're going to plant them in the ground, nine out of ten times you're going to fail. If you want to plant them in the ground, plant them in a raised bed where you're using that fast draining acidic mix. So like one third peat moss, one third uh, a ground bark, one third sandy fast draining soil. That will give you that acidic mix and it will give you that fast drain. So that will work well. So in a raised bed, in a container, if you are gonna plant them in the ground, take a look at what all the blueberry growers in California do. They don't plant them in the ground. They lay out a row of organic material, two feet wide, 18 inches high, and they plant on the crest of that row of organic material and run their drip line right along the crest of that row. They don't dig a hole, they plant above grade. So they have good drainage and they have organics right there 
for, the, for those berries to root out into it. So every, every blueberry farm you look at in California is gonna be done that way. It's all organic material above soil. And, and if they don't do that, they're probably, they didn't do their homework and they're probably gonna be in trouble in the near future. So if you wanna do blueberries, containers, raised beds, acidic mix, fast range, you'll be fine. Watch the nitrogen, they don't like high nitrogen. We'll talk about fertilizing as, as we move on a little bit. Yes? I don't know if it's the right time to ask it, but we have a um, avocado tree that's in a pot that's way too big. Is there a bad time to trim it down and take it out and trim it up and repot it? Yeah, I think like two o'clock in the morning is a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> that's it? Yeah. Anytime? Yeah, okay. basically. Anytime you won't go in shock or anything? <laughs> Yeah, I don't like to trim at 2 o'clock in the morning. No. Yeah, it's a full moon. It's Good answer, bad. full moon. <laughs> Isn't that great? Okay, let's, um, let's move on. Anybody that's in an area where it gets hot, you're right on the coast, it probably isn't going to be a big help just for that one attribute. But that, you know, that keeping that soil cooler by 10 to 20 degrees during the hottest, most stressful time of the year is really important for good tree culture. Because at the time of year when the tree is going through the most physical stress, you're able to take a lot of that physical stress away by keeping a proper mulch layer there. So that 10 to 20 degrees is huge. If I'm in the desert, if I'm in Riverside, if I'm in El Cajon, if I'm uh, you know anywhere, yeah, anywhere that's 10 or 15 miles east of the coast, keeping that soil temperature cooler in the summer is a very important factor. So you'll get a good 10 to 20 degrees cooler soil temperature during the most stressful time of the year, allowing your trees not to go into a, a physical stress mode. When they physically stress, they defoliate, they drop flowers, they drop fruit, now they're open to sunburn, when you get sunburn, you're in big trouble. So that relieving that physical stress is, is very, very important. And by the way, I agree with everything you said about whitewashing. I'm, I'm, I'm white, everything that goes into the ground gets whitewashed the day that it goes in. I actually uh, re-whitewashed my, my apple project in Irvine yesterday. So. Um, it's it, it, keeping that sun stress off of tender material or even hardy material is very important to the you know, ultimate uh, uh, longevity and success with the tree. So that mulch layer will help to do that, will help to break that, that heat uh, spike during the summer months. Number two, a two to six inch mulch layer will make better use of your irrigation water by 50%. 50%. All the studies over the years, UCR, UC Davis, the Cal Poly's, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, all of those studies that have been done over the years have proven that. A good layer of mulch will make better use of your irrigation water by 50%. Mm -hmm. So I can get away with irrigating any part in my landscape that's mulched only 50% as much as I would irrigate another area. That is gigantic. If it was only that reason alone in Southern California with our, with our drought situation, I know it rained a lot this year, actually had a winter this year, but you know what? We still live in an area that gets infrequent amounts of rain and is, is in general a warmer climate. So even in our best years, it's a good idea to make better use of the irrigation water. It's, it's a commodity in the state of California that has always been stressed and it's always been on the edge and it's never gonna get any better. So if we can make better use of our irrigation water by 50%, I'm all for it. So my entire landscape, everything that's not lawn or hardscape, has a, a two to six inch layer of mulch, and it always will. And I'm, I'm actually at a point now where I need to go in and re-mulch, so sometime in the next couple weeks, I'll be bringing in 15 or 20 cubic yards of mulch and re-mulching re the entire landscape. So I do that about every 18 months to two years, in general. <coughs> so the third attribute <coughs> of mulching would be to increase our bioactivity. It brings back beneficial, it bring back mycorrhizal activity, beneficial insects and fungi, earthworms, all those things that help trees to grow and thrive and feed in a more natural form will reoccur in the soil. It's the way things were meant to grow in nature. Walk out into any forest, walk out into any jungle, walk into the local chaparral in our foothills and look at what's underneath every single plant. There'll be a mulch layer there from years and years and years of leaf drop from those plants and other plants around. Uh, my wife and I went on a uh, a tour years ago with California Avocado Society down to Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama Canal Zone, uh, Belize, you know, some areas in southern Mexico. And we toured um, some new avocado plantings down there and some packing houses, and we toured two different natural avocado forests. And they're, they're 
amazement. I mean, they're, they're giant trees. They're 100 feet tall. And the two of us couldn't touch hands around the trunks of some of those trees. And the first thing you notice when you go out into a natural avocado forest is you sink to your knees in leaf litter. So if you pull that leaf litter away and get down to the ground level, the soil level, you've got all this decomposing going on. You've got all this bioactivity. You've got the roots of the avocado trees coming up out of the soil into that mulch layer, and that's where they're taking their nutrients from. So that's the way trees and shrubs and plants were meant to grow in nature. They're always revitalizing their, their natural organic material underneath them. And what do we do? We pay the gardener to come in with a blower and blow all that stuff away, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Nothing leaves my landscape. I don't, I, I don't take anything out unless it's it's something if it's diseased or something like that, I need to get rid of it, that's fine. But, but any pruning, any lawn clippings, anything that comes off my landscape, I reincorporate into my landscape. Yeah, okay. and, I, and I add to it on a regular basis. So the, the key with a good mulch layer is biodiversity. We'll talk about that in, in, in just a minute. So you, want, you don't want all one product. You never want all redwoods or all grass clippings or all pine needles or all stable rake. You can have all of those things in there at five or 10 or 15% final volume, but you want the biodiversity. You want as many different types of organic product worked into that mulch layer as you can get. So the fourth attribute of a good two to four or six inch mulch layer is, what's the worst chore in the landscape? Weeding. 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 A two to four or six inch layer of mulch will not allow weed seeds to germinate through it. You'll still get some things that are blowing in the wind and you get a little germination on top, but I pretty much guarantee you, it's gonna cut your weed population down by about 80 to 90%. Now, never ever under any circumstances put mulch over Bermuda grass. If you don't take care of the Bermuda grass before you mulch, you will be uh, plagued with this wonderful, vigorous, thick Bermuda grass for the rest of your natural life. So if you're gonna mulch over Bermuda, control the Bermuda before you mulch. Most any other weeds are fine, but those rhizaceous grasses create a problem. So yeah. any other weeds you should be good with. So those are the four main reasons. Uh, eliminating stress factor by keeping soil cooler, making better use of irrigation water by 50%, bringing back natural bioactivity and mycorrhiza, uh, not allowing weed seeds to germinate through it. So now, now that we understand my philosophy on mulching, who has a, an opinion or who has a reason why they should not mulch? No. So if you've enjoyed this educational moment by Ivory Organics, be sure to like it. And most importantly, by subscribing below, you'll be connected to all these other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching, and happy gardening.